Tonight, the papal posse will run down the biggest stories of 2018. Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal are here for a very special World Over Year in Review. Plus, we'll announce our picks for the best and worst persons of 2018. And later, some Christmas memories with musical legends Johnny Mathis and Andy Williams. The World Over Year in Review 2018 starts right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas with your families. And on this, our last show of the year, I wanted to take a look back at the major stories of 2018 and put the last 12 very tumultuous months in perspective. From the worldwide crisis of abuse to the Vatican deal with communist China. We've got a lot to cover, and we'll announce the best and worst persons of 2018. Bet you can't guess what those are. Now, who better to walk us through the year that was than the papal posse? Here in studio is canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray, and editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. So glad to end uh, this year with you. It seems appropriate that we end and begin the new year. So. Buckle up. The tone of 2018 was set pretty early during Pope Francis's trip to Chile in January of 2018 when he dismissed accusations against Archbishop Juan Barros as slander. Now, the bishop was accused of covering up the abuse of a priest, Father Fernando Caradima. The pope later apologized for his defense of Barros, writing, I have fallen into serious mistakes of judgment and understanding of the situation, especially due to a lack of truthful and balanced information. Now I ask pardon of all those that I have offended, and I hope to be able to do so personally in the coming weeks in meetings that I will have with representatives of the persons who were interviewed by Archbishop Chiluna. Now, this was a letter he sent to the, the bishops of Chile. Now, in this case, Posse, the Pope sent in the leading expert on clerical sex abuse, uh, Archbishop Charles Chiluna, to investigate that Chilean situation. He later denounced what he called a culture of abuse and cover-up there. Why haven't we seen this kind of response to allegations of bishops' abuse in other parts of the world? It's a good question. And I think the prior question is, uh, it's good that he recognized this, and I think it was a very generous and, and open admission of, of a problem. But he was getting very bad advice. He said a lack of, a lack of balanced information, which means some people very close to him were giving him some very bad advice about that yeah. situation in Chile. I think, in a way, the same thing is operative here, here in the United States, uh, which I would point to as the, probably the most sensitive of the the various national problems, because America is influential. Yeah. It's influential in a secular sense, but the church in America, which is still a very solid church and a very important church, mm. the fact that we have not dealt more expeditiously with the problem here, I think, also reflects some lack of, of appreciation, appreciation of the urgency in Rome that yeah. this American situation be dealt with. Has so. this damaged the church uh, irreparably, uh, Father Murray, in your estimation? I mean, you see it on the parish level. What are you hearing from people? What are you seeing and hearing from your fellow priests about this? And, and do we need this kind of decisive action from the Vatican that we saw in Chile? Cardinal DiNardo certainly thought so because he went to Rome back in August to ask that the Pope send an investigator very similar to what Archbishop Chacluna did in Chile. Right. And the Pope decided not to take that advice and put it into effect. Um, personally, I think what he did in Chile was good. He needs more information. You know, a question has to be asked, who in the Vatican or who in the Chilean bishop was misinforming him? Why didn't he have a whole picture? Given that that happened in one country, maybe that's happening elsewhere. I think the United States is a case where we do need more vigorous Vatican involvement in the reform effort because bishops only answer to the Pope. Right. Uh, public pressure by the laity and others is good, but bishops answer to the Pope, and I think the Pope needs to send an investigator here. Now, now in this situation, in May, the Pope met with the Chilean bishops in Rome. He accepted the resignations of seven of the 34. Is this a harbinger of things to come, Father Murray? 
Well, that was very dramatic. The entire Chilean, yeah. Chilean hierarchy was in Rome, and they all put their mass resignation in. I don't think that was a great idea, because mm -hmm. not every bishop was involved in right. cover-ups and all the rest. So the, mm -hmm. I don't believe in collective responsibility for the acts of individually uh, bad bishops. Yeah. On the other hand, we can say this. The Pope read the Riot Act and identified that causes have to be dealt with, including homosexuality in seminaries, and Chile specifically spoke about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to say to the American hierarchy, uh, I want similar results. I want people to admit bishops they do who did wrong. I want them to come and tell me. And if not, we're going to have to send in investigators to find out. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really complicated but necessary move. We have to do more investigation mm -hmm. and then act on them. Yeah. Which is Pope, Pope did that in Chile. Yeah. In June of this past year, Cardinal Timothy Dolan announced that former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick had been removed from priestly ministry. The, the Cardinal had been accused, McCarrick, of abuse of a minor. Now, the curious thing was a statement from the Diocese of Metuchen. It read this way. In the past, there have been allegations that he, McCarrick, engaged in sexual behavior with adults. This diocese and the Archdiocese of Newark received three allegations of sexual misconduct with adults decades ago. Two of these allegations resulted in settlements. Why the passivity, Robert Royal, when it came to concerns over a bishop having sexual relations with an adult? Wasn't that a kind of alarm that he may be doing other things as well? Yeah, I think that this really reflects an unfortunate culture in among the bishops that existed at one time. I don't think it, exi it exists any longer. I think every, they're pretty much all on the record that that uh, this sort of thing can happen uh, again in the future. But look, the, the, the important thing at this point going forward is to figure out why there wasn't that sense of urgency and why mm. uh, McCarrick, despite these these egregious ways that he behaved, was was allowed to progress uh, up the, the food chain, so to speak, from bishop to archbishop in, in Newark and then to become right. archbishop, uh, cardinal archbishop of Washington, D.C. There's been, it's, in my judgment, there's been a lot of resistance in Rome to even taking the, the, the barest steps toward looking into that. You recall that before mm -hmm. our bishops, our American bishops met in, in November, um, one of the items on the agenda was to, to urge the Vatican as, as early as possible to release the documents that were relevant to the McCarrick case. And even that, at their meeting, eventually was, was sort of spun to look like it would have been a slap in the face to Rome to say that we urge you uh, to release these documents. So there's still this resistance and there's still a reluctance to recognize that the only thing that is going to restore trust, and, and all of this is beginning to erode the trust of the American Catholic people and the American people more generally in the church. The only thing that's going to restore that trust is a very vigorous, open process. Father Jerry Murray, uh, you heard what Bob said. Uh, there was clearly a push by the American bishops. They wanted an investigation of how McCarrick progressed up the hierarchical chain. Uh, th that was denied to them. Why is there no, not even a canonical trial that we know of anyway? Why, why don't we hear more about a canonical trial? And should he be removed, McCarrick, from the clerical state, given what we know. Based on the evidence that I've read, which is in the public domain, he should be removed from the priesthood. Uh, he used his authority as a bishop, as a priest, and then later bishop, to lure victims and then to commit horrendous crimes against them. Uh, those victims need to have the vindication that the church is not going to passively sit by and let this man retire quietly. Now, why isn't there a canonical process? The Pope said there will be a canonical process, so right now the investigatory stage is, is in place. And mm -hmm. the, Arch, the spokesman of the Archdiocese of New York, Joseph Willing, has said that the Archdiocese of New York is investigating the second accusation concerning sex with a minor, mm -hmm. Mr. James Grine. He came right. out in public and he, right. he accused McCarrick. And that's being investigated. My question is, that's, it's six months now since McCarrick was first accused in June, then in July he was identified as having abused a second minor. Uh, yet we've had no announcements from the Holy See about okay. when the trial is going to be convened. I, I think the Holy See has to recognize that canonical legal processes are not private matters. They're a mm -hmm. matter of public justice in the church, mm -hmm. and public justice involves the good of all. So we as faithful priests and laity, we have a right to know that Justice is being administered in a timely manner. Mm. I got to get to this. One of the biggest stories of 2018. In August, the Pennsylvania grand jury dropped a report 
that released and identified 300 priests who had molested over 1,000 minors over the past seven decades. Now, some of these were allegations, others were proven. Cardinal Donald Wuerl was mentioned many times in that report and implicated in the cover-up of an abusive priest. Now, in October, Pope Francis accepted the resignation of Cardinal Wuerl following criticism of his handling of sex abuse cases in Pittsburgh. The Pope also praised the Cardinal's leadership. As of today, Wuerl is still in Washington, D.C. He serves as the apostolic administrator of the archdiocese. Is that the proper message to send to the laity, Robert Royal? Uh, for me, it's a problem. Um, others may see it in a different way. But look, I think the, the pressure for Cardinal Wuerl to step down in this particular case came from his own priest. You may recall the Holy right. Father said... He keep, Consult he with was, your priest. Yeah, go back and talk with your priest. And they pretty much said to him, look, you've, in several ways, you've been a great guy for us, but you're just in an untenable situation at this mm. point. Again, I repeat, the, the, the slowness and what appears to be a lack of a, a sense, look, these are children. In, in a lot of cases, this is homosexual abuse, but there's also, as in the case of McCarrick, underage children who have been abused. Mm. And whatever else you think about the, the way the process ought to proceed, the, the people of the United States and people around the world want to see their church as taking this very seriously. If we can't get this right, what else are we going to get right mm -hmm. in the world? Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that he still has lingered on, it gives the impression that in spite of the fact of the criticism of this former clericalist culture that existed in the past, mm -hmm. somehow it persists in ways that it shouldn't. And, and if the, a person in, in an as exposed a position as the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., remains after these very serious allegations, what else is going on, I think mm. we have to ask. Father Jerry, I'm going to let you tie that story to this one. Thirteen states are now investigating how the Catholic diocese is treated and handled sex abuse in those respective states. Now, th there's no doubt there seems to be a pattern here, an investigatory pattern that we're going to see reach right into 2019. Tell me about this case in L.A., and auxiliary Archbishop Salazar, there were charges against him. He's been removed, but the Vatican statement on this was very quiet near the end of the year. They, they basically said, you know, he, he's, uh, we've, the Holy Father's accepted his resignation. The case of Salazar is very interesting, uh, to say the least, because it just, this news hit right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And what has been revealed so far has not satisfied me that we know the whole story. Uh, Archbishop Gomez issued a statement to the people of L.A. saying that the Vatican has retired him because based on an, a second investigation of behavior in the year 2002, uh, he had been accused of sex abuse of a minor. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, the, the, diocese, the diocese said, we only knew about it in 2005, after this man had been promoted to be auxiliary bishop. I read in the Los Angeles Times that the Pasadena police said they contacted people in the church in 2002. Yeah. So I'd like to know who's telling the whole story here. Was Archbishop yeah. Gomez fully informed about what the Pasadena police told someone who's mm -hmm. working for mm -hmm. the archdiocese at the time? Yeah. But then secondly, the question is, after he was identified in 2005 uh, as having committed these crimes or accused of the crimes, uh, Cardinal Mahoney went to the Vatican, the Vatican then took the case, and the Vatican said, this man has to be given more or less private punishment. He mm. cannot be exercising pastoral ministry. So he was put into an administrative role in the diocese, but no one knew that, uh -huh. that he was given this penalty private, very mm. similar to what happened to Cardinal McCarrick. It, so uh. we have a system here that is really not functioning well, no. and now he's removed and now we're not quite sure when, who knows what, when. I mean, well, there's this serious. culture of silence. We're seeing this pattern of a culture of silence from diocese to diocese. The Illinois AG claiming that in Chicago and other dioceses in that state, they did not release all 500. There were 500 additional names that they're claiming they have within their uh, files, having reviewed the files of these dioceses. What are we being told here? And what do you make of the image of this? When, when the Texas Rangers bro busted into the, the Houston Galveston Diocese just weeks ago. What are we seeing here, Robert Royal? Well, in that Illinois report, I think the most striking line in there was the, the, uh, the, the sentence that said, this indicates that the bishops are incapable of policing themselves. Mm. 
And we have actually seen a couple of cases. There are, I think, three of them now. Um, Stephen White, who writes for us at the Catholic thing, did a column last week in which he laid out how the fact that certain lay boards, um, independent, slightly independent at least from the, uh, the, the typical operation of the diocese, identify a problem with a bishop. And in at least three cases, and I think the Salazar case is, is one of them, this led to uh, some action on the part of the church, Archbishop Gomez eventually going to Rome, mm -hmm. and then you know, more serious action being taken, even if it was put very passively that his, his uh, resignation has been accepted. So there are ways that, that we can move forward and, and reconfigure the institutional ways that the bishops will be held responsible. Mm -hmm. But looking back, it's a pretty horrifying thing. Father Jerry? The uh, Illinois report is devastating because it reveals there was, they, they found by reviewing the files, 690 complaints were received by the different dioceses, and in about 500 cases, the diocese decided not to pursue those. They decided they were not credible, or they decided that they shouldn't investigate because the priest had died, or because it was a member of a religious order, or apparently because there was only one accusation. In other words, there is, seems to be no criterion which gives favor to listening to an accuser and taking him seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know from the conviction rates based on what's happened right. in 2002, it's not three quarters of the charges are false and only one quarter true. Yeah. So out of 690 cases, 500 and whatever it was are, yeah. are not dealt with. Are ignored. This is an example of why people don't trust the hierarchy. And it, it's really, let's be honest, as a priest, I hate to say this, but it's to our shame when it's a secular authority who comes in to tell us you're not taking sin and crime serious enough. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to do it for us. That's yeah. really a shame. Yeah. And uh, we've got to talk about the big whistleblower, I think, of, of 2018. In August, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, the former nuncio here in the United States, wrote an 11-page testimony accusing several senior prelates of complicity in covering up the sex abuse of Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. He claimed that Cardinal Donald Wuerl, McCarrick's successor, knew of McCarrick's misdeeds. How significant was the Vigano letter in the fall of Donald Wuerl? Well, I mean, it'd be hard to, uh, to overestimate what, what that did. And I, I think that the, the mere fact, anybody who knows Archbishop Vigano, and I knew him slightly when he was here in Washington, can attest that he's a very modest man, he's a very truthful man. He also occupied a position in the Vatican in which he received reports about these sorts of things from all parts of the world. So he's, right. he's very knowledgeable mm -hmm. and experienced in dealing with these things. And it just beggars belief. I think one of the reasons why, the, as we just said earlier, one of the reasons why the D.C. priests uh, regarded Cardinal Worrell's position as in, in untenable any longer is not only what happened that we saw through the, the report in Pennsylvania, but it's also the fact that it's just beggars' belief that he didn't know about, about, about the McCarrick situation. Mm -hmm. We could go into the specifics where McCarrick was told not to appear at, right. at seminaries, which is, had, had been his sort of recruiting again, grounds. Again, here we are, the, the private past. penalties again. Right. These and he'd, 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 he'd actually been living in one and was told not to do that. So it's the... the, the, the uh, Indirect evidence is that, of course, Cardinal World knew about this stuff. And, and to know about that and to, to, to do nothing, and it just seems that there are also figures involved at the highest levels in the Vatican who operated in a similar way. So. Well, and, and this is the next part of the Vigano testimony. I'll read you this little clip. Uh, Archbishop Vigano claims in June of 2013, he met with the Pope. Here's the quote. Immediately after, the Pope asked me in a deceitful way, what is Cardinal McCarrick like? I answered him with complete frankness and, if you want, with great naivete. Holy Father, I don't know if you know Cardinal McCarrick, but if you ask the congregation for bishops, there's a dossier this thick about him. He corrupted generations of seminarians and priests, and Pope Benedict ordered him to withdraw to a life of prayer and penance. The Pope did not make the slightest comment about those very grave words of mine and did not show any expression of surprise on his face, as if he had already known the matter for some time and had immediately changed the subject. But then, what was the Pope's purpose in asking me that question, what is Cardinal McCarrick like? He clearly wanted to find out if I was an ally of McCarrick or not. Father Jerry, your take on this and the lingering impact of this narrative. It's four months now since uh, the Vigano memorandum was published. He's published some subsequent memorandums. Uh, let's just say this. His credibility as a witness to what happened uh, in general, based on what he said, has not been impugned. 
basically the truth of his claims has been uh, manifested. Mm -hmm. The Pope uh, has not responded. He said he wouldn't at the time. He learned of it back in August on the airplane ride back from well, Ireland. We're gonna, we have that. We're going to play okay, that. Okay, good. In a so we'll get to that. But the, the interesting thing is, uh, four months later, no response. The question mark in people's mind hasn't gone away. Did the Pope know about McCarrick being penalized by Pope Benedict? And if he did, why did he drop those penalties and send McCarrick to China as a diplomat and do other things mm -hmm. of that sort? Why was McCarrick being favored by the Holy See in the pontificate of Pope Francis? Uh, it, it's a legitimate concern, and I, I said on the show a number of months ago, I was in Rome at the time, we should have the po ask the Pope, with all due respect, to hold himself to the same standard he would hold any other bishop or archbishop in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. If the Archbishop of Exville had favored a Monsignor in his diocese, knowing that he had had a canonical penalty imposed right. by a pope for sex abuse, for sex abuse, and then kept it quiet, and then sent, you know, forgot about it. The pope was saying, "Wait a minute, mm -hmm. you know, if my predecessor did something, I got to follow through." So the questions are still there. I hope the pope, of course, he can answer any time he wants. I mm -hmm. hope he mm -hmm. does. Well, here was his response. You alluded to it a moment Good. ago, and this really overshadowed his entire trip to Ireland. He said this. He's speaking in Italian. I'll translate. I will not say one word on this. I think the statement speaks for itself, and you have sufficient journalistic capacity to reach your own conclusions. It is an act of trust. When time will pass and you'll draw the conclusions, maybe I will speak, but I'd like that you do this job in a professional way. Now, bishops asked for an investigation, but uh, what do you make of the continued silence and the lack of interest in these allegations in Rome? Robert Royal. Well, there hasn't been exactly silence, because we know that Cardinal Ouellette, who's yes. the head of the Congregation of the for Bishops, kind of replied, but he didn't, as Father rightly said, he didn't, re he didn't go to the substance of what Vigano raised as well. Yeah, he nibbled around the edges. And then also, I, I think it's very regrettable that the Holy Father started to talk about accusers in the, in the church, that there are people who are seeking to divide the church and are accusers. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that Vigano was seeking to, to, to divide anybody. I think Vigano, who not only had that brief conversation that you just described with, with the Holy Father, but later at the Holy Father's invitation, he spent an hour one-on-one -on -one with him and told him in much greater detail about the problems with, with McCarrick. Mm -hmm. So this had to be... The Pope had to know about this. The, the charges that are laid out there and the number of people that he, that he, um, he identifies as being involved in, in this process, this can, be, this can be worked out. Those documents can be traced. He's, he's told us where the documents are. They can be looked at. There, there, there should be records of all, all of these things. If we have an honest and open uh, investigation of the, these things, I think it'll put people's fears to rest. The longer that the silence or the, the, the uh, misdirection, we could even call it, goes on, mm -hmm. I think the more suspicions people have, and rightly so. Yeah. No, Father the Pope Jaren. told the journalists to do their job, and we know from what journalists have written, they started calling people on the list, the right. cardinals and other officials, about what happened. Nobody wanted to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Pope has to recognize that the journalist can't do his job, which is to get to the truth of the matter. Mm. And the Pope admitted in the Chilean case that he had made a mistake. If the Pope said, I made a mistake about McCarrick, I was too trusting or I was forgiving, I think most Catholics say, Holy Father, we understand you were acting as a, as a shepherd. Mm -hmm. Please uh, accept, you know, from our point of view, that's a mistake to avoid in the future, but we understand it happened. Right. Instead, the, the stonewalling, if I can use that word, by saying I will no. not say a word, most people say, no, wait a minute. <laughs> The shepherd is getting asked a question by the sheep. Let the sheep have an answer. Well, and it also promotes the narrative that there's a conspiracy of silence in the Catholic Church, which is a bad narrative to confirm at the highest levels. I mean, just as a PR initiative, it seems somebody should, should be on this case and, and, and make the public aware of it, just to clear the air, just to get, if anything, shoot holes in Vigano's account. But no one's been able to do that. The, no, the, for, the, for whatever reason. It's, it's been held up. He's, it, different things he said, documents have shown mm -hmm. it. He uses logic to prove that the critics don't take his point seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, Vigano is an honorable man. In America, whistleblowers are not enemies of the state. Mm -hmm. Whistleblowers in government are viewed as providing us an opportunity to find out if it's we're being subverted right. by malefactors. If, if their allegations prove true. Yes, and then that's why we have whistleblower protections, but also investigations. Right. If the Pope announced an investigation of this where documents and witnesses and everything was held, mm -hmm. I'd be the most happy priest in the world because I'd say, you know, it makes sense now 
things are clear, the Pope is, has as much interest as I do that this kind of thing doesn't go on in the church, rather than what it seems to be protection. Well, they've authorized some kind of review of files, yeah, but, but again, but, where's the accountability? Yeah, no, but, Who's doing look, this if, review? As, if, if, as people say in the secular sphere, justice not only has to be done, it has to be seen to be done. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps in the old days it was possible to have a procedure that was more or less secret. Uh, you, you, especially when you have priests and bishops involved, you want to keep a certain decorum about the process. But these days we need to see sort of constant reinforcement yeah. that something is being done. And the fact, I, I think it was very shocking, it was shocking to me and I'm sure it was shocking to a lot of other people, when our bishops, who seem to want to at least take some steps to do the right, right. thing, in November. Were, were, in November, were told not to do it. In fact, before they met, the Holy Father had, as, had suggested that they go on retreat rather than have their regular November meeting, and, and, mm -hmm. and, which was specifically intended to deal with holding bishops accountable and to also put together a moral code for how people ought to act. Now, they are going to have a, a retreat in um, Illinois in, in January, and then I mean, we're not only six months into the McCarrick case, but then there'll be another month before, in February, we'll have a meeting of the, the presidents of bishops' conferences from around the world, which, by the way, is being billed as largely listening to a bunch of experts about ab an abuse crisis. So it doesn't, even what's come yeah. out doesn't seem to express a sense of urgency about a very serious problem. Well, I, you've jumped ahead of a little bit, but it's good. Uh, we were going to talk about the November meeting. They wanted to take these concrete steps, Father Jerry, and they, let's face it, they were kind of toothless steps, but at least they were in unison that they would make a statement and the public would say they're committed to this. There's very little they can do because as I learned, as the audience learned, when we had Cardinal Mueller sitting where you're sitting, Sitting, the former head of this, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, only the bishop, only the pope can investigate a bishop and deliver penalties upon a bishop. That's where we are. The, the CDF can't do it. The Congregation of Bishops can't do it. Only the pope can do it. So my question is this. When the pope said, don't do anything, don't take action, has that built up unrealistic expectations of the February meeting? And what do you think we're going to see there? The February meeting is unknown at this point because no agenda has been published, but we do know they've, they've now uh, submitted a questionnaire that's going to be sent to the different hierarchies. Uh, back to the November meeting, the one provision that I really liked that was not voted on, of course, at the Holy See's request is that there be a mechanism to report uh, either sexual abuse by a bishop or abuse of authority which would then be forwarded to, would be sent to a lay committee, right. who would then forward it to the nuncio. Mm -hmm. I like that because expertise is being used to analyze what's coming in. It's true, the pope is the one who decides, mm -hmm. but, you know, the pope operates with the curia, he's got court system and all the rest, needs to make use of it. Bob's point is very true. Justice has to be seen, not just operating uh, mm -hmm. behind the now, scenes. Now, what Bob told me sparked my, my remembrance of this. The pope made another surprising announcement regarding this meeting in February. He appointed Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago to be part of the organizing committee. Now, when the sex abuse crisis was getting heated up last year, especially after the Vigano testimony came out, Supich was asked what he thought about the sex abuse crisis and the Vigano charges. Here's what he said. The Pope has a bigger agenda. He's got to get on with other things, of talking about the environment and uh, protecting uh, migrants and carrying on the work of the church. We're not going to go down a rabbit hole on this. Quite frankly, they also don't like him because he's a Latino. Given that the Illinois AG is now calling out the dioceses in Illinois for withholding the names of priests, given what we know about other affairs in Illinois, uh, including that it, it's now going to be the site of this retreat, is Cardinal Supich the man to shape this critical meeting in February? Well, if we put this in the context of the problem in Chile that we started out with, mm -hmm. there again seems to be there, there's, there are rumors that McCarrick was influential in, in getting Supich into Chicago and, and uh, Cardinal Tobin into Newark. Again, we seem to see that there's a kind of a network still operating here and that the, the Holy Father, instead of 
relying on more independent sources is actually going to certain figures who, at least for now, I, we, we don't have any evidence of this, but at least we have to have some suspicions. Well, there's about allegations on the table where, against yeah, of what, what's happening. Now, mm -hmm. to, to say that the more important issues are environmentalism and immigration and whatnot, this seems to me to get entirely wrong, the, the urgency of what the church needs to do. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of, of secular outfits that are going to be handling environment and, and, and uh, immigration questions. The church has got to get its own house in order. Mm -hmm. but this may very well be the, the key defining issue for this papacy and for the church for some time to come. And so to, to set up uh, what already is a weak meeting of, of a lot of bishops who don't really care about this issue. It's, it's primarily a European and a American and Australian issue. There are some Latin American cases. By the way, I think it's a slander to say that people don't like the Pope because he's a Latino. I think lots of people like him because he's, he's a Latino. Mm -hmm. I think this is just one way, again, to, to not deal with what is the most pressing issue mm -hmm. for the church a, a, at this time. Father Jerry, your reaction? I was surprised uh, that Cardinal Supic was named to this post because the meeting concerns presidents of bishops' conferences, and he is not the president of the American Bishops' Conference. Cardinal DiNardo is, and it's quite clear that this meeting was called in response to what happened with the McCarrick case plus the Pennsylvania Attorney General report. Mm -hmm. Now, the Pope has his advisors. Supic is one of them, obviously, and I'm sure he can give good advice. But my question here is, why wasn't Cardinal DiNardo picked because he was, he's actually going to be at the meeting. Now, Supic right. will be at the meeting, I assume, mm -hmm. because of this position on the organizing committee. Look, everybody's going to make their opinion known, either directly or through the media, on what should happen. Uh, let's hope that they have a power to put something together at this meeting that will actually have teeth mm -hmm. so that we can get to this problem. Well, it, it, look, in one way, maybe it's good that Cardinal DiNardo is there in his, his role as the president of the bishops' conference and is not part of the organizing committee, which mm -hmm. is probably a different thing. But why not have Cardinal O'Malley of Boston in, involved in that? Cardinal O'Malley is the head of the committee, commission that the Holy Father set up himself for the protection of young people. And so that com commission is, has specifically been dealing with this for several years now. Right. And, and Cardinal O'Malley is a very respected guy. He's a part of the, the Pope C9, the, the special nine cardinals that mm -hmm. have been selected to give him advice. It would have made a lot more sense to pick someone who's from a more neutral corner and, and then let him bring that experience that, that he has, expertise yeah. that he has, to the, the crafting of what's going to happen in this meeting. And the people that I respect in Rome who have had some kind of look into the way, what they're thinking about, they talk about lectures being given by experts on child abuse and not getting down to the nuts mm -hmm. and bolts. And maybe that's a good thing, too, because if our bishops, our American bishops, are left free to come back and after that discussion craft some more effective means on their own, maybe that's better than, than yeah. waiting for Rome to come up with a universal... But canonically, they yeah. can't do anything. So I don't care. That's why, as Cardinal Burke said on the show last week, we don't need any more documents. Everything's in place. Make use of the, the, the uh, trial process as well as the... Uh, penal process that exists today. You don't need any other documents. Speaking of documents, I have to mention uh, Bishop Robert Morlino, who is a regular on this show. Uh, he passed away this year, but not before writing a letter that really galvanized, I think, the attention of so many people, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. Here's what he said about the subculture within the church as he looked at the sex abuse crisis. We'll put it up on the screen for you. He said, to be clear, in the specific situations at hand, we are talking about deviant, sexual, almost exclusively homosexual acts by clerics. We're also talking about homosexual propositions and abuses against seminarians and young priests by powerful priests, bishops, and cardinals. We are talking about acts and actions which are not only in violation of the sacred promises made by some, in short, sacrilege, but also in violation of the moral, natural, moral law for all. To call it anything else would be deceitful and would only ignore the problem further. Father Jerry Murray, the impact of that letter. Uh, Bishop Marlino, who is much regretted his early uh, death, is certainly a cause of sorrow. But uh, he, that statement that he made, that letter he wrote to his people, is absolutely on target. Uh, the problem that we have in the Catholic Church right now regarding sexual abuse largely concerns homosexual activity by priests. And there have been networks of seminarians, some of whom then got ordained, who were involved in sexual activity, homosexual activity in seminaries. Uh, this, the McCarrick thing really blew the lid off it because payoffs were made to protect his reputation, even though those dioceses were convinced that he had sexually abused two males. Hmm. Uh, so the answer to this uh, problem is truth. 
get to the bottom of, of what's happening. Morlino did that in his letter. Uh, this doesn't mean hatred for homosexuals. That's usually a, a debating technique that's thrown against anybody who criticizes homosexual activity. Homosexual activity is against God's law. To call people to repentance is to do the essential mission of the church, and that's an act of love. I mean, the apostolate that we, that we have in the Archdiocese of New York, courage, offers hope to people of a homosexual problem in their lives. Covering up, pretending it's not wrong, that's not what needs to be done. Bishop Morlino was prophetic. Okay, I want to move on to uh, some big doings at the Vatican, mm -hmm. where teaching was uh, adapted a bit, and the, the major international news, really, of the year, the Vatican signing an agreement with China that would essentially allow the Chinese government to pick bishops that they think should be appointed, and the Vatican would then have the final say to approve or turn those down. Your thoughts on this agreement and what can be done at this point, Robert Royal? Well, I'm very worried about it. Uh, I'm very worried about it because China in general is a, is a worrying uh, mm -hmm. thing in the, in the modern world. But I don't see what the benefit has been. We, we, the, the accord has remained secret. It has not yep. been published, so we don't know specifically what it says. However, you can see what's happening in China. And it's not only happening to the Catholic Church, it's happening to the Protestants. There's repression. Churches are being closed. Yep. Uh, just hey, look at the images. We have the images on the screen yeah, just now. At the, just at look. the end of the, the year, some of the Protestant churches, some of the, what they call house churches, they're sort mm -hmm. of storefront churches, hundreds of them are being closed. Well, and, and, they're a, being re and a major leader, a major uh, a house pastor just arrested. And look, we know what the nature of communism is. And the, it's the nature of communism to want to control everything within the society to give a different view of the human person. It is not the human person is made in the image and likeness of God. It is the human person made for the, the purposes of the state. And it, mm -hmm. every attempt to reform, so-called reform, or uh, it's sinicized, they call it, the churches, mm -hmm. this is really to try to make the church more uh, amenable to what the, the state wants to do in China. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see what the benefit has been to the church. I see what the benefit is to the Chinese government. Sure. And we already see the two underground bishops, who have been very courageous, were asked to step down yeah. by the Holy See so that government-appointed bishops could become, they would become auxiliaries where the government-appointed bishops would become the, the, uh, the ruling bishop in, in those areas. To me, this just smacks of further and further concession to a regime that is not going to stop in what it wants from, from mm. the church, and I don't know what the church gets back as a result. What did you make of, um, of Monsignor Chaley from the Vatican going and actually delivering the letter from Cardinal Perilene to that underground bishop saying, you know, the Pope wants you to step aside. We've got a, uh, a man approved by the communist government. He's going to be taking your place. And what can the guy do? He did. He, he in obedience, stepped down. It's an unbelievable thing that this would happen to bishops who have basically been so loyal to the church that they're either in prison or risk being imprisoned for their loyalty. Now, I think we have to step back and ask a prior question. Why does the Chinese government want to have any involvement in the naming of Catholic bishops? Is it because they're interested in the evangelization of the people in China? Mm -hmm. Not at all. They view the church as a political entity that they want to control. And by agreeing to that on our part, we're agreeing to their premises. Mm. Uh, th this is not the way the church should operate. There are two quick issues I have to get to before we run out of time. Earlier this year, the Pope made a change to the catechism regarding the death penalty. I'll put up the old teaching first and then the new. He said the traditional teaching, this is the old catechism, the traditional teaching of the church does not exclude recourse to the death penalty if this is the way of effectively defending human lives against the unjust aggressor. The cases in which execution of the offender is an absolute necessity are very rare, if not practically non-existent. Now, here's the new updated version. It reads, Today, however, there is an increasing awareness that the dignity of the person is not lost even after the commission of very serious crimes. Consequently, the Church teaches in light of the Gospel that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. And she works with determination for its abolition worldwide. Robert Royal, Father Jerry, very quickly, if the Pope can change the catechism here, could a future Pope change it back or change it to something else? Or change else? other things, because obviously there, this is based on, on some reading of human history that says we are somehow morally more advanced than our, our ancestors were. We are not. 
I think in a lot of ways we may actually have gone backward and, and just to cite abortion as one possibility where 50, 60 million children can be executed in a country like the United States. I think this is very worrisome. Mm -hmm. um, it's a clear contradiction of what the church has taught of since its, its beginning. If you go back to Augustine or Aquinas or any of the great thinkers, I think this is not a development. I think this is a contradiction. Father Jerry. Yeah, the Pope has the power to change what's written in the catechism, but he cannot change church, church teaching on this matter. Uh, the death penalty is not immoral per se. The church has never taught that. It's taught just the exact opposite. And it is not a violation of human dignity to kill people who are guilty of certain crimes or people who are in the process of committing a crime or waging war. You know, if putting someone to death violates their, uh, uh, their human dignity, mm -hmm. well, then should we disarm police? Should we surrender armies? You know, the, the church's teaching on this is much richer than simply uh, inflicting vengeance on someone. That's not what this is all about. Well, we'll be watching all of that in 2019. Thank you both for being here. Thank Pleasure you. Pleasure as always, Raymond. As we bring this year in review portion of the show to a close, I thought we'd be remiss without naming the world over best and worst persons of 2018. First, the best person of 2018 is Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. His testimony clearly changed the dynamic of the year. His charges helped internationalize awareness of the corporate silence that permitted malefactors to rise through the ranks of the church. The questions he raised still have not been answered, but the effects of Vigano's testimony will be felt well into 2019. And now for the worst person. This one was tough because there were so many contenders. But the winner is, if you can say that, Theodore McCarrick. He became the face of corruption in 2018. His scandalous behavior and the questions about how he rose to such prominence when so many in the church knew of his indiscretions continue to confound, and answers really do need to be provided. Well, that does it for the best and worst of the year. But since we're still in the thick of the Christmas season, I wanted to end tonight with some Christmas memories from two of my favorite musical guests. Between them, they really are the voices of Christmas. I had the privilege of sitting down with both of these legendary performers to talk about the meaning of Christmas, and they kindly graced the show with their music. Here are some incredible moments from my Yuletide conversations with Johnny Mathis and the late Andy Williams. Enjoy. Over the ground lies a mantle of white of heaven of diamonds shine down through the night two hearts are thrilling in spite of the chilling weather love knows no season love knows no climb romance can blossom any old time here in the open, we're walking and hoping together, 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 together. Sleigh bells ring. Are you listening in the lane? Snow is glistening. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight, walking in a winter wonderland. Gone away is the bluebird Here to stay is a new bird He's singing a love song as we go along Walking in a winter wonderland In the meadow we can build a snowman And pretend that he's a circus clown We'll have lots of fun with Mr. Snowman Until the other kitties knock and die When it snows, ain't it thrilling? Go your nose, get it chillin'. All it can play the Eskimo way, walking in a winter wonderland. Walking in a winter wonderland. Winter wonder, winter wonderland. Winter, winter wonder, wonderland.
Let's talk for a moment about Christmas and your favorite Christmas song. Do you have one? Or have you become so accustomed to singing those Christmas songs that you just go, you know, like Santa Claus, I'm going to put the costume on, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do this, and then I can't wait for January to come. <laughs> Is there a little bit of that? <laughs> Christmas songs are, uh, are like candy. You, you eat it and then it, it goes away and you <laughs> 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 sort of glad it did <laughs> until next year. Don't, ah, yeah. don't worry, I'll be back next year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's that way uh, because a lot of them are and I say this in a nice way, trivial kind yes, of that's right. singing. Uh, not really singing, just kind of singing. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. They're, almost, they're sing along <laughs> yeah. songs rather than right. a song you sing. Right. And for, for years and years, Christmas music was kind of that way. Mm. But I mind some old Bing Crosby songs uh, that he sang at Christmas time. Uh, uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year, wonderful song written by. Uh, oh, sure. The director of uh, the Tonight Show, I think. Mm. Um, uh, but the Christmas songs have gotten much better. What is your Christmas wish for everyone watching this Christmas, this New Year's? I'm sending you a little Christmas wrapped up with love, a little peace, a little light to remind you of how I'm waiting for you, praying for you. I forgot the words. <laughs> you got the best part in, uh, did I? Okay. I love that. Christmas is so special to me uh, because of the music, of course, but mm -hmm. because I'm able to, to share it uh, a little bit more. Well, I'm thankful for your spirit and how you imbue the holidays and this music. As you said, these songs can be pretty trivial, but in the hands of the right people. They're filled with life and love and joy, and Thank you, you do that. Now, can I have a Christmas request, just mm. a little tiny request? Yes. Can I sing with Johnny Mathis for a minute? Yes. What shall we sing? Just hear those sleigh bells, bells ringling, ting, 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 tingling too. Come along, it's lovely weather for a sleigh ride together with you. Outside the snow is falling and friends are calling you. Come on, it's lovely weather for a sleigh ride together with you and you and you. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, let's go, let's look at the show. We're riding in a wonderland of snow. snow. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, it's grand, just holding your hand. We're gliding along with the song of a wintry fairy land. Our cheeks, that's the hardest part of that song to sing. Rosy and comfy cozy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Merry Christmas, Johnny. Thank Memphis. you. What a joy. Thank you. Andy, thank you so much oh, you're for being welcome. here. I'm glad to be here. It is a great honor. And I want to get into some of the book, but I want to start with Christmas. Why do you think you're so identified with Christmas? What is it about your voice, your persona? Uh, I mean, I can think of only one other artist, Nat King Cole that I think of as being so identified with Christmas? Well, I guess it would have to be because I've done so much television, mm -hmm. you know, over the years. I've I had my own show for nearly 10 years, mm -hmm. and so there's a Christmas show involved there every year. Uh -huh. And then I've stayed on after um, the, the series went off the air. I st still did, um, uh, I think, three years of Christmas shows after that. So I've been, and I have six Christmas albums out, so yeah. I guess I better be known for Christmas. <laughs> well, let me tell you. I've you wasted were, a lot of time. No, no, no. You're a staple at our house, and a little bit later you'll be singing for us, and I thank you for agreeing to do that. Uh, you were born in Wall Lake, Iowa, and you, you started singing with your brothers, but this, wasn't a, this was a pretty difficult moment in your life. I mean, you, it was real poverty and rough. Well, we were, we were poor, but my father was, my father was working anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a railway mail clerk, a guy that sorts, sorts mail on a train as it's moving, you know, between small towns. And uh, so, so he, we weren't destitute, but we were quite, quite poor. Mm -hmm. And, but none of the kids knew it, you know, mm -hmm. everybody, everybody could eat. Yeah. Everybody wore hand-me-downs, you know, from somebody else. He'd even barter for your shoes and oh, yeah. food on occasion. <laughs> well, he did. He was great at that. Uh-huh. He would take us into, well, when we moved to Des Moines, uh, we needed shoes. So he took us into a Florsheim shoe shop, and he got us all fitted for shoes. Now he said, now let's talk about how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> now, he, he, there was another phrase that he repeated to you that 
lingered long in your memory when he oh, said, uh, yeah. you have to practice harder because you're not as good as others out there. He told you and your brothers that. Yeah, he said, you're not as good as the others, so you have to work harder. And that's a terrible thing to say to a little kid. Mm -hmm. I was uh, seven years old when he got us all together and put our hands together and, and said, one for all and all for one, and you've got to work harder because you're not as good as the others. Huh. So I took that to heart. You know, my, I, I don't know whether my brothers did that much, mm -hmm. but I did. And I, so all my life, I never thought I was as good as the others. Wow. So I had to work harder. Mm -hmm. And I, in the long run, I guess it was good because I did work harder. <laughs> and I didn't give up what I, you know, ordinarily people would give yeah. up if they had as much problem getting going as I did. What was when I was it, singing alone, I'm talking about now. What was Christmas like during those years of struggle? Well, it was when great. In, in Wall Lake, Iowa, it was, it was so small mm -hmm. that uh, everybody's door was open. Mm -hmm. And they would even string lights from one house to another. You know, it was just a big communal Christmas. You sort of see that in the Christmas specials throughout the years right. that you had. It was the community was always coming together at Andy's little <laughs> cottage or house or wherever you were. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun doing those shows. It really was because I had my brothers. I hadn't <laughs> sung with them in a long time. Mm -hmm. So every Christmas we'd sing. Uh -huh. um, my wife and children were mm -hmm. growing up during that time. Right. Um, so people I think liked to watch the show year after year to see the children go. Yep. You know, well, what, are they, what do they look like now? Yeah. Now, tell me, how do you warm up? How do you take care of this voice? I, With... don't, I don't do anything. I don't warm oh. up. <laughs> At all? No. Oh, my God. I, before I go on, I do some uh, moves. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. To get the sound up mm -hmm. into the mask. To get, it, to get this moving a little bit, mm -hmm. the, the larynx and the vocal cords. And that's it? That's, yeah, that's the warm up? It. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's depressing. Mm -hmm. River. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. moo all day and I won't be able to sing that. that well, it'll, it'll, get the, it'll get everything loosened up. And mm -hmm. T tell me about your Christmas wish this year. What is your Christmas wish for your fans, for those watching us tonight? Well, I just wish everybody have a happy, merry Christmas, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and don't think the world is coming to an end. There's uh, still hope. There's still hope. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we want to get across. Could you, before I let you go, can you fulfill a huge Christmas wish of mine? Now, what would that be? Could we sing, I wish you a Merry Christmas? You want to sing, I wish you a Merry Christmas? You and me, All together. Right. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Harmony with the oh. great man himself. Thank you. Andy, Thank you. You've made my Christmas. Well, and you, I know you've made mine too. I think um, this was a lot of fun. It's a most wonderful time of the year. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the hap happiest season of all. With those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call. It's a hap Happiest season of all There'll be parties for hosting Marshmallows for toasting Caroling out in the snow There'll be scary ghost stories And tales of the glories of Christmases Long ago It's the most wonderful time of the year There'll be much mistletoe, hearts will be glowing when love runs are near. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows for toasting, caroling out in the snow. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of glories of Christmases long ago. Oh, oh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be much mistletoe, hearts will be glowing when love runs are near. 
It's the most wonderful time. Yes, the most wonderful time. It's the most wonderful time. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Remember, book three of the Will Wilder series is coming this February. In the meantime, the first two books, Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls, and The Lost Staff of Wonders are available at bookstores everywhere, including the EWTN catalog. Be sure to join us next week for an encore of the World Over Christmas special. We're still in the Christmas season, after all. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Have a blessed Christmas season and a very happy new year. All the best for 2019. Bye now.